Okay. So my talk uh, is going to actually have three parts. Oh. A little bit about how this all started, because it's complicated, and uh, I think the various introductions sort of get it right, but there are certain things that we sort of did a long time ago that I think were quite useful. A little bit about what we're currently doing, and also a sort of side project that involves solving large and difficult structures. This is a case where nature has sort of created a very beautiful mathematical object. So in terms of structural biology, it really goes back, as was said, to Aria and Schneeu Livson. In 1967, I went to work with Aria as a programmer. He gave me a Fortran 2 manual and said, learn programming, and I still owe him one for that, I guess. Uh, they were working on a force field, People often ask me, did force fields start in Star Trek, or did we think about force fields first? And I think we were first, but we were not first. It was well known in the field. And uh, this was an attempt to represent the potential energy of any molecule by a very simple potential function. You might call this a balls and spring potential function, something that uh, almost anybody can understand. So the idea basically is to represent the energy of a molecule by springs, for bond length bending and bond, for bond length stretching and bond angle bending, torsional terms, van der Waals terms, and electrostatics. Now, in this equation, there are certain things like b and theta and phi and r that depend on the structure. And there are other things that define, that parameterize the force field. So, for example, if you want to stretch a bond, there's a parameter that tells you what the equilibrium length of the bond is, and another parameter that tells you how stiff the bond is. Now, if you take this potential function and you actually put the names of the people involved, you discover that this is very much a dead physicist's force field. And uh, I I'm making this point because, in fact, when we started it in the computer back in the uh, late 60s, there was no alternative. Things were very, very slow. But I think uh, nowadays, a very, very large fraction of the world's supercomputer time, the academic supercomputer time, is actually spent evaluating this function, which is kind of a pity, I think. Okay, so one of the nice things about physics is if you have one thing, you can often get a, a whole lot more. So as I said, we had the energy function. With an energy function, a bit like a roller coaster, we can calculate many things. We can do minimization, which uses forces to go downhill. One nice thing in physics is that what works in one dimension usually works in any number of dimensions, so there's the same thing in two dimensions. Then we can do vibration about a minimum. Things will vibrate. And we do it in one dimension or in two. Then we have molecular dynamics, which is using the forces, but keeping the kinetic energy to basically move downhill, and that's shown here in one dimension. Go over the barrier and then stop the system. Also in two dimensions. And finally, Monte Carlo, which is really hard to do in one dimension. And again, you can put names on this. And there's a very, very wide range of dates, probably two and a half millennia. And uh, probably the most interesting one is Metropolis. This is the date of birth of Metropolis, of Metropolis, Metropolis, Rosenbluth, Rosenbluth, and Teller. This very simple equation was classified for about 10 years and used to follow neutron diffusion in hydrogen bomb design. Okay. So this means that if you have the energy function, you can get almost anything. And the point was, is this exactly is what Aria and Schneer wanted me to do? They wanted me to write a computer program oops, that would allow them to calculate the conformations, vibrational spectra, en energies of, and structures of simple, very simple molecules. And then they could go back, see if those properties agree with the experiment, and change the parameters. It's a very simple but quite difficult thing to do. Okay. So uh, at the same time, I was... I suddenly realized that the same programs that were used for molecules with maybe 30 atoms could actually be used with molecules for 1,000 atoms, because if you didn't do second derivatives, if you didn't do frequencies, you didn't require a matrix that is 30 times 30, and 30 times 30 is almost 1,000. So in the same space, you could do a whole protein. Uh, with Schneeu Lifson, I was able to do protein minimization, uh, an entire protein, using Schneeu's sort of uh, 
consistent idea, I just made up energy functions. Things like oxygen and nitrogen attract each other, sulfur is bigger than oxygen and nitrogen and things like that. It was possible to make up energy functions and use them over here. Uh, Ari and I then worked on coarse grain models. Uh, this is an attempt to basically leave out most of the atoms. It enabled us to sort of make a protein chain fold up in 1975. Uh, by combining energy minimization with normal mode jumping. Another thing that Aria did with me was to basically go in the other direction. Instead of simplifying things by throwing away atoms, you make things more complicated by just taking a few atoms and putting quantum mechanical electron orbitals on them. So suddenly half a dozen atoms become as complicated as the whole system, but by carefully choosing the atoms, and most importantly, very carefully worrying about how these atoms interact with the rest of the system, and that's something that Arya did very beautifully, one can basically treat part of the system quantum mechanically and part of the system classically. Uh, in 1977, uh, Martin Karplis with Andy McCammon and Bruce Geddon published the first MD simulation of a small protein uh, in vacuum. It was a hard thing to visualize, so quite soon afterwards I made a movie with Richard Feldman at the NIH just showing what dynamics actually looked like. This movie was made at, at, at great expense. Each frame was like a day of supercomputer time, and drawing a sphere back then was really difficult. The person who drew the sphere algorithm went on to found Pixar, the animation company, so he was really, really good at computer graphics. Looking at the motion, and this movie was made, as I said, in, in actually in, in 77, in 78, uh, but we basically got it a few seconds at a time because it took them a very long time to actually make the celluloid. It, it, the motion is very interesting because it, nothing else sort of looks like this. Basically, everything is moving around, no real rhythm to the movement, and it's not actually going anywhere. So it's kind of jiggling, and this seems to characterize uh, molecular motion uh, there are actually a couple of wa four water molecules were inside the structure, and because the whole structure was in vacuum, these molecules are actually diffusing away. Uh, I tried to, I, I've thought of many analogies for what this looks like. One is a bag of worms. Sometimes worms get together like in a, a bag, a, 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 a web. Another is a, maybe a discotheque of a very funny shape, very crowded, no one can hear the music, and people are just moving around. So, uh, okay. Uh, but the big problem was is that those calculations didn't include water. Water had been pioneered by Raman, who first did argon, and then uh, Raman and Stillinger liquid water. And adding proteins into water was a big deal because you couldn't just use any energy functions. You had to use energy functions that fitted the water energy functions. And another problem was that calculations in water are about 100 times slower. So it wasn't until almost 10 years later that working with Ruth Sharon, an engineer at the Weizmann Institute, we were able to actually run a simulation of 200 picoseconds. This required something like half a million dollars of NSF supercomputer time. It was one, one hour of Cray XMP time per picosecond. And basically this showed that the structure in water remains much closer to the X-ray structure than other results in vacuum, either by us or others. A little bit afterwards, Valerie Daggett, my first postdoc, uh, basically showed how alpha helices behave in water. That's my next movie. So now we have a box of water. The water box is periodic, so this wall is the same as this wall and so on. An alpha helix in the box, jiggling around. I made this movie in 1990 when I got a chance to talk to Linus Pauling in a lecture, and it was really a thrill to show him the alpha helix. The first set of movies had it all backwards because I forgot to reverse the negative. So uh, anyway, uh, this just shows an alpha helix at room temperature. It's very stable. Hydrogen bonds are breaking and reforming, but nothing dramatic is happening. Common sense is that if you heat the structure, it should come apart. So now we're going to do exactly the same thing at high temperature. The temperature is much too high. It's 200 degrees centigrade, and before you even saw it, it came apart. But, you know, these movies have been around for a long time. They were actually made by filming off the screen of a silicon graphics. I had a Bolex 60 millimeter camera, and I didn't realize how important alignment is. All professional photographers would have told me, get the alignment right, because it's going to be wrong forever. So things are kind of crooked. So this structure is basically unfolding. There are certain interesting things happening. The next scene is probably the nicest, because it's in space filling.
Ja. So it looks a bit like a python, a snake. If you do the same thing with glycine, it looks very smooth, which is not surprising. Okay. So that basically, oh, then there was another thing we did. My first PhD student, Mary Hirschberg, who actually started with me at the Weizmann Institute and then came to Stanford, actually did a very, very similar thing for DNA in water. DNA was a very difficult thing to run because DNA has very large uh, negatively charged phosphate groups. You need uh, sodium ions. Basically, she found that in water, this green line, the structure is very well behaved. In vacuum, it just goes crazy. Here's a movie. This is a 12 base pair segment of DNA. Cutting through the box, you can see it. Uh, not too much is going to happen. And that's because we've got it right. Here's the clock. These are picoseconds. This is at room temperature. And basically, the structure is moving relatively peacefully. There is some breakage at the ends of the strands. There's also an AT pair that breaks inside the helix. There is some motion. Basically, I'm just speeding up the clock, so it looks like it's moving more and more and more, but the clock is just speeding up. Here are the sodium ions diffusing very freely. But the important thing is, you can see the base pair is broken. We see the same thing in skeleton. Okay, so uh, that gets us through this first part, which sort of gives you some part of the, the background, because in many ways, you know, it's the things I did when I was in my very early 20s that ended up being sort of important. But I, I do tell people that I actually continue to work ever since. I probably didn't need to, uh, but anyway, I did. Um, okay, so this is something we're currently working on. I'm just going to give you two snapshots. We're trying to look at very, very large structures in exactly the same way that Aria was talking about big motors. And our approaches are a little bit different, but I think complementary. So one very large system we looked at is RNA polymerase. Uh, Roger Kornberg solved the crystal structure of, of this molecule. And Shui Huang was a postdoc in my lab. And Daniel Silva is his PhD student. Shui is now an independent, an, independent, an independent professor, just got tenure at Hong Kong University. And here's a movie that Daniel made, which is really wonderful. So it's a large system, almost half a million atoms. But we're going to simulate the motion using something called Markov state models. So basically, it looks like it's moving very quickly. This is a microsecond clock rather than a picosecond clock. But what it's really doing is it's jumping between states in a random way. We use all our computer time to evaluate the state space of the system and essentially describe the entire system by a thousand local minima and the barriers between them. And with that, we can actually describe the system. So in Daniel's movie, he shows how the blue strand of DNA gets transcribed to a red strand of RNA. And the key part of the reaction is for this nucleotide to be shepher sh shepherded across this helix over to here so an incoming nucleotide can bind to it. And here's a little cheat sheet that shows you what's happening. When it starts to go down here, it's starting to move. So it's going to go half the way down. It's moved part of the way across. Then it goes all the way across. And I think if I click this, it stops. Yeah. So at this point, an incoming uh, Trif uh, nucleotide triphosphate could come in, bind to this piece, form a bond, and extend the RNA. This is a very, very simple reaction compared to the things we see in the ribosome or even the uh, ATPase uh, motors that Aria talked about. Okay. So uh, this was using this technique of Markov state molecular dynamics. It wasn't a long simulation. One of the nice things about Markov state uh, molecular dynamics is that it basically forces you to look at the system. You've got to basically look at a thousand different conformations, try to understand the pathways between them. And in that sense, uh, it's really important because the hardest thing about a simulation is actually looking at the results. Something else we did required much less computer time. It was the normal modes of an entire ribosome done by ex-postdocs Janelle Bray and Junji Chung. Junji is now an assistant professor at Texas A&M. Janelle decided to join LinkedIn. Uh, 
here we just see the structure in a simplified, reduced form, coarse-grained, and with all the atoms. These are very exaggerated movements, but at least they show you the kinds of things that this object can do. This is the large subunit, the small subunit. Here are tRNAs. And this, is, this whole calculation takes about four or five hours on my laptop. So this is not a huge supercomputer calculation. And one of the reasons for doing this, I think, is to one of the hardest things in this whole business is to form a bridge with experimentalists. Now, the reason exp uh, computer, computer, computational people uh, aren't very faithful, they're happy to work on any system. It's just atoms. The trouble is, is that if I, say, move from RNA polymerase to the ribosome, I probably have to read and understand 10,000 papers. Now, that's really, really hard. So we try to have representations like this as a way to form an interface to the brain of the experimentalist who actually knows all about the system. And then he can look at this and say, oh, gee, that is interesting. I didn't realize this. And we're taking this further now. We've now got uh, an investment in Oculus Rifts. These are the virtual reality headsets. And the hope is you'll be able to go into this with the experimentalist, and he'll be green dot, and I'll be a red dot. And we can just sit there talking about what, what's going on. So that's something that we're interested in. So let me now move to solving large and difficult structures. OK. So the structure we're going to work on is the eukaryote chaperonin. The work is going to be done by an ex-postdoc, Nia Kalisman, who's now a junior faculty at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and Gunnar Schroeder, who left my lab about 10 years ago, and is now tenured in Julich in Germany. But we sort of brought him back to help solve this problem. So the chaperonin is a machine. It basically has eight subunits in two rings. It binds ATP and then closes down on the substrate. This is a movie I made by Junji again. He did this for his PhD with Wachu. This molecule, in some way as a chaperonin, takes unfolded proteins and catalyzes their folding. Okay. Now, this is a very interesting system because there are two kinds of chaperones that have almost exactly the same shape, but if you like, different coloring. So this is almost like a coloring problem, which people love in, in, in mathematics. Okay, so the basic idea... Oops. The basic idea is, is that in archaea, the third kingdom of life after eukaryotes and bacteria, essentially have all the 16 subunits exactly the same. So this is the molecule, just to go back here, has two rings, each which has eight subunits. You can't actually see all eight here, but there are. If you, this is the top view of the same thing. In eukaryotes, all the way up from yeast to humans, there are always eight different genes going around here. Now, the genes are actually quite similar. Say the gray gene and the brown gene have about 30% identity and so on for the other colors. But what's really important is, is that the red subunit, say, between yeast and humans, are actually 60% identical. So these things have diverged from each other in order to maintain something special for each location. So this is a machine that's sort of elaborate. It's almost a Baroque machine. Okay. Now, the problem is, is what is the order? And it's a hard problem because there are so many different orders. It's very easy if you have a string of eight colors, and these letters are now the names of the chains, and it's complicated because these are Latin letters used for Greek names, so it's actually alpha, gamma, zeta, eta, whatever. I don't even know all the letters. But basically, uh, you can make a string of eight things in a circle in seven factorial ways. That's seven times six times five times four. And that's because you could always start with the letter A. It's a circle. But if you have two of these, you can now decide, OK, who is under A? And any one of these eight can be under A. So you have seven factorial times eight, which is a little bit over 40,000 different arrangements. So there are 40,000 ways of putting the colors on an object like this. OK. Now, Another reason you can say it's hard is that very, very competent groups got it wrong. And uh, first, there was a paper in 2010 
by Latke, Friedman, and Chu. I, I, usually when things are wrong, I only mention the names of the senior authors. That just seems fair. Uh, so Latke, Chu, Friedman, and Chu got it wrong in a paper in PNAS. They did just a massive cryo-EM study. They looked at about a million single particles. They thought they could get the right arrangement from the diode axis, which they thought they'd found like this, and they came up with this arrangement. Uh, another group, Pearl and Willison in England, used crystallography. They crystallized this huge object, uh, at, managed to collect data at 3.8 angstrom resolution, solved the structure, and they came up with a different order. Okay. Now, at about the same time, I had a postdoc uh, near Kalisman who came to me wanting to work on mass spectrometry. I said, I have no idea what mass spectrometry is. In fact, for most of the time he was with me, I thought it was mass spectroscopy. So, and maybe it is, I don't know. So he wanted to do this, and it turns out that to our surprise, it isn't that hard to do. Many people have, whenever I talk about mass spectrometry, people raise all the problems and how you force cross-linking and how you force destruction, you force the reaction. But in our hands, something like 16 cross-links in a structure of one megadalton completely solved the problem. So here is what, what we did. So basically, you take CCT, which is the chaperonin, you mix it with a reagent called BS3, which is basically a reactive chain with two reactive groups at the end. It cross-links lysines that are closer than 28 angstroms. That's a long distance. Now, what we did is something which we think is going to be very, very useful. The reason that both of those groups got it wrong is they started out with preferred model. And when the data is very poor, almost th your first model will seem to satisfy everything. The only way you could know it was wrong is if you generated all possible models and you chose the best one. So this is what we call combinatorial homology modeling. We built all models exactly equally. We don't in any way try to favor one model. We don't, so it's very, it's, you know, I think modeling is a bit like falling in love. The first model you have, you're in love with, and it's really hard to go and, you know, find another 40,000 other people. So basically, on the computer, it's really easy. We built all the models. We then looked at what lysine should be connected and got a measure of how many were within that 28 angstroms and what was the sum of the violations. And basically, there was one best answer. Of course, there's always one best answer. More importantly, the two, the EM answer and the crystallography answer were very, very bad on this basis. Okay. Um, this we call the OMS structure for optimal mass spectrometry structure. Uh, and it was sort of interesting. This just shows on the scale of the molecule where the crosslinks were. So this is the crosslinking agent. It's huge. It's about the same size as myoglobin across. But this is a big molecule, so it works. And this was the organization. Now, it's important to realize that this string of letters can be rotated, can be permuted. It doesn't matter where you start, because it's just a circle. So, this, you're gonna, this is the one I talked about before. It's not going to become like this, and you, you know, that's what it is. It's very hard to remember these things, anyway. So what we wanted to do was to say, okay, we could get the structure of this correctly, by mass spec, we thought, but could we have gone back to the crystallography and done it by exactly the same combinatorial approach to crystallography? So the crystal structure is quite difficult. It's got two of these complete spheres, in the asymmetric unit. They actually have a diode axis between them, you can see down here, but the crystal does not use the diode. So the asymmetric unit is two megadaltons. Now, what's very important to realize is, is that since the overall structure is essentially the same, all that changes are the side chains, which are a bit like the colors changing. So you can represent an object like this, which can be rotated in eight ways around here. You could basically move the light blue to the magenta, to the white, etc in both cases, uh, and also has all the combinatorics of each of these subunits, you can represent it by actually by four strings like this. And each string can now be rotated around. This gives you eight times eight times eight factorial possibilities, which is a bit more than two and a half million. Now, keeping with the exact same idea, we want to treat them all equally. So the idea was, it's much, much better to treat them all equally than to treat some specially. One problem with crystallography is that if you have a, well, one good thing about crystallography is if you have a structure and you have X-ray data, you can tell how well it fits. The trouble is, is that without refinement, 
the fit is always 50%, which is not significant. So this is a problem. And we decided to ignore the various warnings we had got from experts and just simply calculate the R factor, which is a measure of the agreement between the calculated and observed crystal scattering data for all two and a half million structures. This wasn't such a big deal. It takes about 10 seconds to do each one. This is totally trivially parallelizable. It took a cluster maybe two or three weeks. Okay, now what you find is that they were actually right. All the values are between 0.499 or 49.9% and 50%. So, 50%. But if you have them all, you can actually, you have a built-in control. So what you can do is you can make a distribution. Now the distribution can be made on a linear scale when you don't see singletons, or on a log scale, the lowest value is 0.499, and that turns out to be 10 standard deviations away from the mean. Now, that is highly significant for a thing like this. It also turns out that every one of these points is a different ordering, and this one corresponded to the mass spec structure. But we still weren't really happy with this. I mean, if you're going to say somebody's wrong, you really want to be very, very careful. So we said, what you can do is that is obviously, if, if this had been a random distribution, a proper Gaussian, this would be a quadratic function. And all of this is a tail. So let's just take some number of structures from this bottom end and compare their sequences. This, not the sequences of the structures, but these sequences, the sequences of the ring order. We do that. We took 10, but you can take almost any number. And you find something very interesting. So this is the structure with the, the best R value, the lowest R value, 0.497, and then the next best one, 0.4986. We had to modify the program to put out values to six decimal places because the original program only put them out to three decimal places, and we would have lost all those things. That's all we had to do. But basically, when you put them like this, and you can rank them just by decreasing R value or increasing R value, you now get all these sequences. Everyone has to be different, but you can immediately see a consensus. This line is almost always B. This is D, this is A, this is G, etc. So therefore, the consensus of all of those, which is just the most common one, actually happens to be exactly the same as the top one over here, and exactly the same as the mass spec structure. So now we felt pretty much convinced that this was the right ordering. Now, what about functions? This is a very beautiful structure. Why does it have this sort of broken symmetry? If all chaperone needs to do is perform a cavity, so an unfolded protein, can crawl into it and fold without being worried by other proteins, why does it need this elaboration? Well, it turns out that we also, by using the same crystallographic technique, solved a harder problem, which uh, a group in, in Spain had collected X-ray data for the open form of CCT. This was at 5.5 angstrom resolution, but even there we could actually assign the side chains. They didn't even try to assign the side chains. So basically, we have models based on other people's crystal data for the closed form with actin bound and for the open form with tubulin bound. Now, the first thing we noticed is if you align them like this, the substrate binds in exactly the same place, whether it's open or closed. Then Amnon Horowitz at the Weizmann Institute had done mutational studies. He, there's a critical aspartic acid in the ATPase binding site, and he'd knocked that out. And he had seen which strains of yeast were viable without that key aspartic acid. And he found that you could knock the aspartic acid out in the Q, Z, and G positions, but not in these. So how dark these lines are, for example, in the D subunit, you knock the aspartic acid out, and it's lethal. So by measuring degrees of uh, survivability, you can measure in vivo how important it is to have those aspartic acids. So it looks like, oops, you don't need these, sub, these subunits are there for binding, and these subunits are there for the ATPase. So you sort of have a model where you can imagine you have eight fingers, and three of the fingers hold the substrate in place, and the others sort of go like this. Now, they're going to be catalyzing ATP at different rates. They have different ATP binding sites. So it's kind of a much more interesting system for basically undoing a knot or undoing a uh, difficult-to-fold protein. It's also true that in all the cases where people have found substrates, it's almost always actin-like. It's either actin or tubulin or something like that. Now, recently I was visiting Singapore, and I know that Bengt likes Singapore. So here's a slide for him. There's a very beautiful uh, museum of art, science and art. 
but actually it, has, it actually has nine fingers, but let's just say we ignore one. Some of them are very long, so we think that it's a bit like the substrate is over here, and these are the very active subunits that can come in and sort of tear the whole thing apart, and when it fully folds, maybe they will close down or something like that. Okay, so now let me just say a few words about what's next, and, and there's two aspects about this. There's the general aspect about the field. So if we look at simulation, probably it goes back to the molecular dynamics work done by Anusa Raman on liquid argon through water, through proteins in vacuum, through proteins in water, etc. We've got something like a thousand million times more resources. Computers are about a thousand times, a thousand million times faster per unit dollar. Okay. What's interesting is how has the field spent that factor of 10 to the 9? So what's interesting is that the systems have got bigger. We're not looking at, a, at 64 argon atoms, we're looking at ribosomes. They've got bigger by something like a factor of 1,000. Most importantly, the runs have become much longer. People are now running simulations that last, real simulations that last microseconds. The earliest ones were a few picoseconds. And the earliest minimization would have been effectively a tenth of a picosecond or something like that. Surprisingly, energy functions have actually become simpler. Raman and Stillinger use lone pairs in their water model. Nobody uses lone pairs anymore. We use a three-point water model instead of a five-point water model. So, you know, we really have to ask, does this force field really model reality properly? And, and my belief is it does very, very well, but I think it, it's very, very difficult to calculate what nature can, can get very, very easily, and that's why we've had to spend such a huge factor in longer simulations to get better numbers. But I think ultimately we're going to need to improve on the dead physicist's energy function. It turns out that uh, one problem, I think, in any field, the biggest problem is conservatism. Ideas become established. And when it takes a long time for science to proceed, ideas become very established. So it turns out that you might think it would be obvious that we need to use quantum mechanics. Uh, people have used, I think Lund uh, has used quantum mechanics, Gunnar Carlson. But basically, it turns out in the USA, it's impossible to get any kind of public funding to try to develop a force field using quantum mechanics. So we were lucky because through various venture capital connections, we started a a company in, in, in Moscow in, nine, in 2001. Uh, at that time, physicists were very, very easy to get hold of in Moscow, and it, the cost of living was very low. It's completely changed since then. And uh, I was on the scientific advisory board of this company called Algodine. In, 19, in 2005, they published this paper showing a force field, which is a bit more complicated mathematically than this. But the computer program only takes about a factor of 10 longer. The basic idea is very simple. It goes back to certainly work that was thought about in the 70s. I know that Enrico Clementi wanted to do this. You take two molecules, two water molecules, and you put them in a certain pose. And then using the best quantum mechanics you can, you calculate the energy of interaction. And then you repeat that for many, many different poses. Now, the trouble is, is your quantum mechanics has to be really, really good. And what had happened is that, that factor of 1,000 million for simulations was also there for quantum mechanics. And with a factor of 1,000 million, quantum mechanics became much more accurate. Energies can now be calculated to a fraction of a kilocalorie. And that is a, a big deal. So it's possible to take all sorts of components of proteins, put them into various poses, calculate, fit this to a force field, and then get a force field. We actually used this in a study that I did a few years ago with Leonid Peroslavets and Gaurav Chopra. Gaurav was a PhD student of mine at the time. Leonid, a postdoc, who actually came from the group in, in Moscow. And we were able to take buximetafullerene, put it in a big box of water, treat the whole thing by a quantum mechanical force field, and show that it makes a big difference on the ordering of the water. In classical simulations, the water is ordered to about one layer, in quantum simulations to two or three layers. So that was nice to see. Uh, I should also have pointed out that Algodine stopped existing in about 2009. 
Um, but recently, together with Roger Kornberg, we've sort of picked it up in another company which is doing very similar things called InterX. So the idea is, is to derive much, much better energy functions, maybe not so much for simulations of proteins and nuclear acids, but very importantly for drugs. Okay. Uh, just wanted to say a few words about my group. It's a very small group right now. Uh, I always used to feel a little bit uh, self-conscious about my wide variety of interests, but now we have four people Andrea is working on comparing whole genomes. Jana Goffman is working on the cryo of membrane proteins. Uh, Ivan Ufemtsev on the X-ray phase problem and density functional quantum mechanics. And Nick Corpesius on the ribosome dynamics and chaperonin. And finally, I wanted to thank you all, but especially, oops, to wish happy birthday to Bengt. This slide was inspired by Dick Zer, who tends to send emails like that, and I had fun playing with the colors. Thank you all very much. Time for a question. Can you get the microphone up there? In the there you go. I would like to come to the defense of the crystallographers, being a crystallographer myself, and we have such a broad audience here that uh, maybe people get a little bit uh, difficult perception. So if you have two angstrom resolution or better, then it's usually very easy to get the structure right. But if you have Worse resolution, you have to be more careful. Um, you should, of course, also think about the crystal contacts, which might influence the system. And if you would, for example, have a random orientation, then you, so let's say none of these would be right, but you could have it in random order, then you would always get like an average of the systems, yeah. which you might also have to take I mean, into you, account. You raised two interesting points. One is, that this was meant to, well, I didn't have the full title, but my official title was Large and Difficult Structures with Less Information. And in some ways, if the crystallographers had had uh, two angstrom resolution data rather than 3.8, it wouldn't have been a problem. My guess is also if the EM had been done with a modern detector, it also wouldn't have been a problem. I just think, but I think the key thing here is there's much more one of when the data is less abundant, you, you can either wait until you get more data, or else you can take a much more combinatorial approach, and it's t it turns out possible to tease out of it information. It's there, but it's much more hard to see. In other words, the classical methods usually involve choosing an idea and hoping that the structure will tell you when you're wrong. So if you're threading a high-resolution protein chain and your threading is wrong, at some point it'll say this is impossible. Uh, and at low resolution, you don't get that feedback. So. Uh, Mm, but uh, have you ever tested on the possibility that you might have a random order and then you might uh, just luckily get the one or other? Okay, the, the random order is, is interesting. We got exactly the same order by mass spec and by the crystallography. They were sort of independent, theoretically. Uh, a professional mass spec group uh, under Rudy Ebersolt got the same uh, order with like a hundred cross-links instead of our 16, and that again is complicated. It also seems to me very difficult to understand how nature would design something uh, to have a random order. I think the other thing is that the open form and the closed form are totally independent, and they had exactly the same order. So it just seems to me that, I mean, I think what is a little bit sad about this whole problem is that most proteins aren't like this. So it's, just, it's sort of like curiosity, it's a special case, it's kind of cute, but I don't think it's going to be of general value necessarily. Thank you. All right. I think if there's any more discussion, we should save it for the, for the panel discussion, which is going to come up. Thank you very much again for a very enlightening talk. With a lot of material.